What's up, y'all? I'm Jeremiah, and you are listening to Chain Reaction. Thanks for joining us today. I am uh, as typical, as is usual, these days with my co-host, Jeremiah Harding. What's going on, man? How's it going? I'm um, reasonable. It's fucking hot over here, though, so I've got the whole bandana thing going. Yeah, you got to keep that sweat out of your eyes. Yeah, th- yeah, because I don't want to keep on touching my face. It's a sign of a liar. Well, I touch my face all the time, but I'm usually lying, so it's, it's fair. Everything I say is a lie and, and the truth at the same time. I'm a paradox. I'm sarcastic. That's what that mm. means. <laughs> yeah, I... It's been pretty hot out here lately, and it it comes at kind of a poor time because I've been doing this this kind of new rare uh, thing for me called exercise, and it's been uh, really really sweaty. I decided like a few months ago to sign up for a it's called a Tough Mudder. It's it's like a, a ten mile obstacle course kind of. It's not even they don't even call it a race, but that's basically what it is and i think it's they call it a tough mutter i don't know that it's really that difficult but i think it helps old men like me feel like we still uh got got some toughness left in us but man well what i i, I want to go through that and uh the spartan race at some point in my life i don't know what's the spartan race all right i think harding's out harding did you hear me what's this what's the spartan race Ah, uh, the Spartan race. Sorry, connection issues for some reason. I, yeah, I, I think it's partially because there's a dryer like next to, uh, ne- like on the other side of this wall, in between the router and I. So whatever. Um, but the Spartan race is like the Tough Mudder, only it's just de- like it's designed to 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 really like push people beyond. And if you can medal in the Spartan race uh, against like anybody of any competitive merit. Like it's it's really really difficult to do. So I want to and and also this is this is my bucket list right here, Ninja Warrior. I want to compete yeah. on fucking Ninja Warrior. Are you training for that? They have they have got uh, like I will facilities do once near I get a stuff, decent right? uh, a decent amount of equipment. Gotcha. Well, uh, sort of. I mean, they they have facilities in L.A., but um, that's not that because I'm me, like I nah, because I'm I'm in the middle of the desert, but yeah. um. But, like, effectively, uh, what I'm training for, like, in multiple ways, is sort of like multiple different types of exercise. And uh, and if 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 that falls into place, then then I'll be glad, you know, basically. But uh, it's it's either going to be because I trained there or because I trained um, once I move east, you know, because that's yeah. still in my plans, but. Yeah, Ninja Warrior. I, I I want to beat the all of those courses, and you know, not just be an American Ninja Warrior, but like actually beat the official Ninja Warrior courses. Because American Ninja Warrior is nerfed up. It's like they're you're American. Yeah, in Japan, you're fat, you have to run through swords, pretty much. I'm guessing. I'm just making that well. Up, it, on, everything's extreme in Japan, but in Japan, um, they're they're it's just much more um, the it's. The curves are steeper. The um, the the obstacles are further apart when you have to jump. It's just a much more complex challenge, and uh, and I don't you know I don't just want to do American Ninja Warrior and succeed. I want to do like Ninja Warrior, Ninja Warrior, and succeed at some point. Yeah. Well, yeah. Signing signing up it's for sort, it got it's sort me of to like do what I want. Like the Olympics. Go ahead. I was I was just gonna well, say yeah. si- signing up for the Tough Mudder got me to do. What I was trying to get myself to do, which is exercise, do things like run to the gym and then work out and then run back like a crazy person. That was an accident. I'm trying to turn my phone off. But uh, it, I I uh, highly recommend it. I am sleeping better at night and uh, feel a little bit more rested. I think my body is just a little bit, does a little bit better job at processing oxygen. So it feels good to have exercise, but it sure is rough when you're doing it and you're an elderly person like myself so well yeah and 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 what's difficult for me is like when i do exercise like hard at all um because like the amount of caffeine i'm on normally isn't good for exercise so i've actually been sort of uh, lowering that amount lately 
Um, but essentially, um, the uh, it, it's it's hard to maintain good cardio when your heart's already beating faster than, than it than the, the 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 regular benchmark. So right. Yeah. Yeah, it makes sense. So today's show, we got a friend of ours is going to call in, or we're going to call him in about 15 minutes from now, right about 5.30 Eastern, if you happen to be watching right now. Um, look forward to you talking to him about a few things. Jeremiah has a topic in mind, and I hope we have time to just talk about uh, his life and life experience a little bit, knowing what I know about him. His name is Skip, if I didn't mention that. And also, I had a revelation while I was thinking about the show and talking to Skip today, something that I had always sung as a child now has meaning to me, where before it was meaningless. So I don't, I don't know, uh, Jeremiah, if you ever sang the song "Skip, Skip, Skip to the Loo." Ever sing that? Is that talking about going to the bathroom? Anyone? I I don't I I don't know. I think "loo" means like left or something. Well, that's too bad. Like hanging a Louie? I don't know, but I, somehow that song came into my head when I was thinking about Skip, and I thought, if this song is about getting excited to go to the bathroom, then I'm all about it, and I need to start uh, integrating it into my daily activity more. Mm. I love the throne. Well, let, me, let me see what that means. Let me, let me Google that. All right, that. you see what it means. Uh, next week, I am going to be in Texas, so we are not going to do a show i mean we we could record one and figure out a time but that's just feels prohibitively difficult with my life right now so no show next week and we'll be back doing this two weeks from now i think this is episode 26 and we put out a show every week which is fairly impressive in terms of consistent content production i'd make uh, no claims about the quality of our content and people can decide it for themselves but no one no one can deny that we have it, and it's consistent. So that's something. Did you find out anything about Lou? I mean, this is vitally important information for me and for our listeners to know what skip to the Lou means. Um, okay, so it, it seems to be a Lou is a love, and you're supposed to steal somebody's partner in the dance that accompanies the song. That Okay, fine, that's stupid. I'm done with it. Yeah, oh, okay. Yeah, the Lou in the title comes from the word Lou, a Scottish word for love. Okay, so you're supposed to, I guess it's one of those ones where you're supposed to, like, fucking do -si do over to somebody else and, like, elbow their wife or something. Interesting tactic. All right, so news recently, we've got about 10 minutes. We're kind of killing time a little bit, not getting into any t topics with much depth. But uh, there was the uh, incident in Manchester a few days ago. Harding, you want to talk about that, mention that at all? Oh, well, base, it's your basic kind of like terrorist uh, situation. And, you know, not to say that terrorist situations are like basic in a diminutive way, but, um, you know, suicide bomber backpack dropped it off. It blew up a lot of people. In fact, no, he didn't drop it off. He 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 was a suicide bomber, of course. Um, and you know, it it killed like, like a bunch of people. It injured a bunch more, and it it got the standard reaction that terrorists get, which is basically to totally capitulate and, and let the terrorists win. So, you know, it, but it, it, what's really interesting is how this only makes people upset when it happens in the first in, in, in the in the first world exactly. like like i i have i have a facebook friend who's uh, a military personnel uh, or a veteran i think he's either one of those and he lives in kabul and there was a car bomb that went off and um and he marked himself safe on facebook so i knew about the car bomb but it wasn't on any real like trending anything, not where I am, and it wasn't you know trending on Twitter. There was no pray for Kabul, um, even though the same sort of thing happened and it killed more people and injured even more than it killed. Um, you know, in total, the the if you combine the totals, it's it's a, it's a, it's a little under double 
the amount of people killed in Manchester and, mm. you know, nobody gives a shit because it happened in the third world. And, you know, that's really telling because nobody gives a shit when it happens in the third world and the U.S. is responsible either. They right. don't care about drone bombs or an aggressive foreign policy. They just care about, you know, little kids at an Ariana Grande concert or whatever. Yeah. I, I think I pronounced that name wrong, but. Are, is it Ariana Grande? I think that might be. I don't know. I think it's I, I know she sings music. That e, yeah. That can't be a silent E. Who's heard of such a thing? Not in English. Yeah, I, I think I think there's a lot of things at play there. It it really seems to be true that on average in the US, the the people care more about what happens in Western nations, about people that they think are more like them. I, I, I do think that's somewhat of an evolutionarily driven human perspective, but it is something that's definitely able to be overcome if through rational thought and valuing humans as universe thinking of humans as universally valuable but it's also really convenient for the media because when you can create all this not the media it's really convenient for the government whether it's deliberate or not i you know i suspect it's a combination of of being deliberate and being something that viewers are more inclined to listen to but it it takes the conversation and it makes it about terrorism and it makes it about what to do about radical Islam and what to do about these refugees. So then you have all this discussion where these different groups are are asking for government to import refugees or asking for government to export refugees or asking for government to do more to kill the terrorists in these various nations around the world, you'll notice that most of the conversation in the mainstream is about how the government can do something in relation to the situation. It's never stop bombing these nations, you dumbasses. It's, it's never let's, uh, let's uh, try a new foreign policy strategy and just take 10 years off of bombing Muslim majority nations and engaging in regime change and just see if terrorism is still such a big threat if all these people from these nations are continuing to want to destroy the east in these uh, desperate uh, attempts and lashing out at at others i mean it's horrific i and you always end up in the conversations with people advocating for some sort of government policy that if you if you frame it as blowback they try to paint you as if you're trying to justify the terrorist actions and i hopefully listeners to the show know that that's bullshit and we would never try to justify their actions just like we would never try to justify the actions of the state and nato overseas yeah well and and the great thing is that they can discuss you know um they can discuss how this bombing means that we should act you know we should do x y and z but they don't think about how you know that might transliterate to them as well it might be like you know they bombed another one of our towns again for like the second time this week what should we do they don't think about responses to their actions they can dish it out but never take it they're the playground fucking bully yeah. Yeah, it's I and it's I you see there's responses. It's it just uh, it's one of these issues we continue to harp on and I I kind of don't like saying the same thing over and over again, but it it bothers me that there's this jump to blame Islam when yes, there are there's a lot of violence in the text, but historically religions have always been used to justify violence and they've their religious texts have always been used as a tool to help convince people to otherize, otherize those who they are doing violence to. And it wasn't that long ago in the U.S. when Christians were using the Bible to explain why slavery should be justified and why invading all these Native American, American Indian-held territories was a 
good thing to do, an okay thing to do, because they were, you know, the chosen people of God who God wanted to go and uh, own and occupy these areas held by these other people. It's not that different than terrorism. You're just terrorizing people that have not wronged you in a different way. Like all, all religions can be violent in the right context and right environment. And I suspect that if people in the U.S. became Muslim, that it, or if, if people in areas of the world that are more stable and not subject to U.S. bombs become Muslim, they're going to be significantly less likely than those in those areas to engage in violence as a result of the religion. Yeah, well, you know, and, and there is a lot wrong with Islam, not not to, you know, go off on that bent. There is a lot wrong, you know, that I can obviously yeah. see. Yes, but and, and, and it varies between the, strands, though. You know, like some, yeah. like it's dangerous to paint it with a very broad brush, but it's super obvious. There are tons of sects that have interpretations of their scriptures that are extremely violent and dangerous and problematic. Yeah, it, but but that's the thing, though, is that when you say Islam, um, people people feel the need to you know overcompensate. Either you're entirely um, bigoted because you're saying anything against this party, which the bigots are also saying something against, um, or you're you know, with them, you're with the tolerant liberals. And to me, that's the wrong distinction. It's, 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 it's a false dichotomy. All you're saying in that instance is that I won't take a stand on any of this. It doesn't really matter to me. And that's, that's fundamentally uh, terrible. But what's more fundamentally terrible is not recognizing that the U.S. government has been radicalizing them for a very long time and that you can't stop uh, that radicalization by saying that Islam is the problem when it's a bombing, bombing um, that that place in 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 the UK, that was that was pretty guaranteeably a response to something that the U.S. government did, um, you know, or or one of its connected powers, because the UK is closer to the regions that the U.S. government generally messes up more, um, but that doesn't mean that we have to like ethically be okay with the bombing it just means that maybe we should understand that the world is more than just a simple he did and more you know interconnected than that and maybe we should stop fucking bombing people and expecting them to sit there and do nothing yeah terrorism has always been the cost of empire and it continues to be no shit yeah yeah and again like this the level of control over the conversation is kind of annoying in so many circles because and people they don't bring up immediately that oh the US just made a 110 billion dollar arms deal with the Saudis who are known funders of people intimately involved with the 911 hijackers and known funders of ISIS by the admission of the US government themselves and they you know in the past they funded al qaeda and it's very would be very surprising if they weren't funding them now no they they do they fund an arm in yeah. in syria they have been we've known with with the us's help it's it's so it's so so misleading and when you point to these you can point to these things that everyone then just grasps onto it's islam or or the crazier one is that it's islamophobia or the mm. one thing was it was it Bernie Sanders who mentioned climate change in a conversation like this, or I believe like so, Nancy yes. Pelosi or someone like that? Like, and, of, just, and of course, you know nonsense. the people. And of course, the people on the fucking left are all saying that pulling out of the Paris Agreement is somehow racist, because that's a fucking thing. Yeah. Hey, hold on. Yeah. I'm gonna get up and close my door. I, I think this would be a good time to uh, to call Skip, though. Well, I, I, w I was just about to call Skip, and I was going to ask you to introduce him while I call him, but that's all right. I'll try <laughs> right. to do two well, things let, at once. His let phone me do should an be introduction ringing. Then. Let, oh. let me do an introduction then, and then I'll get up and, uh, and uh, we can, all we right, can introduce get to that. Skip. Skip. Skip is the free rifleman on Twitter. He oh, is yeah. uh, 
his bio basic is, is it reads when the government's very, boot is on your throat whether it is a left boot or a left or a right boot is of no consequence it's a quote from gary lloyd the two boots of authoritarianism he is an anarchist a capitalist and uh, a veteran all right sweet thanks hey skip i i didn't adjust the audio uh I didn't test the audio that I adjusted, so just let me know if either I or Jeremiah is too hot or too cold. Uh, it sounds fine from here. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Yeah, thank you. I'm glad. Excellent. You. All right. I'm the, You are uh, talking to Jeremiah Mitchell right now, and Harding's playing some game with himself. I don't know. He's uh, he's off screen. Thanks for joining us, Skip. It's really uh, good to hear your voice. I appreciate my interactions with you on Twitter. It's been very helpful at uh, aiding me in my search for guns. <laughs> that's kind of Skip's oh, thing. Good. So yeah, that's been great. And uh, I I love having you as one of the token anarchists, being both a cop and is it a I know former military. Is it former marine? No, I was the army. Oh, you were army. Okay, I must. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. But still, one of those people you know you can point to in the anarchist community and be like, "See, see, some some cops turn, some of them change." Yeah. Yeah, it's true. Uh, you know, it, it started back in 2001 when Bill Bupert and I became really good friends, nice. and you know we ended up going down this path of. You know, he kind of turned me on to the fact that libertarians were actually more pro-gun than Republicans. That's actually the very first red pill I took. Yeah. And, yeah, and once that's I not realized, something a lot of them realize. Correct. And once I realized that Republicans were a bunch of pussies when it came to guns, it uh, brought about a new light of um, the way to look at freedom in general. And that, you know, once I started down that path, there was no stopping me, but... If you don't follow uh, Zero Gov or uh, Bill Bupert on Twitter, and um, he also has his own blog, um, definitely check it out. Yeah. Yeah, they, there's a lot of good stuff there, for sure. All yeah. right. Jeremiah Harding, you had a topic you wanted to discuss with Skip. Basically messaging, and because uh, that's that's what Skip, uh, Skip has uh a lot of experience in is anarchist messaging and i wanted to get his perspective on what the best way to deliver anarchist messages are would you mind discussing that skip absolutely i, I would love to talk about that um what i have done is kind of found out like a little bit of a potpourri of everything and then i look and see what kind of effects that i get from them uh obviously the great meme war of 2016 um thanks you know, for your Oh yeah, exactly. Um, so that, that right there just showed me exactly how much power memes have. Um, I don't know if you remember, uh, back when, um, there was a release on, uh, um, on vault seven, one of the documents that was in there was that CIA was conducting, uh, cyber warfare by way of memes. Yeah, that yep. was a crazy revelation. I think we mentioned that on the show a while back when that that first broke. Yeah. It's not surprising. Well, it's a little surprising that the CIA is that smart. Sometimes I get surprised by the intelligence of the deep state. It gets to be a little scary. Well, I would say that you can always bank on the um, incompetence for, um, for a place to uh, hide, to slither, to uh, snake free. Um, from, you know, their chains that they try to put you on, you know, um, of course we're all on the plantation, but some, you know, some animals are freer than others. And what I would say is, is that, you know, you can almost always count on their general incompetence to, um, you know, catch, you know, let's face it in, in the, in the words of Ben Stone subversion. And that's exactly, you know, what, what we do on Twitter every day is to, you know, take that, uh, you know, beautiful, blessed, you know, vision of what people want to call nationalism or whatever it is. And we just shatter it um, one post at a time. Yeah, we try to r reveal to people that the angel of light is actually Satan himself. 
That's correct. I agree with that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the, the other cool thing about being an anarchist is you realize that the government doesn't want to control guns to save people. They want to control guns to be the only ones who have certain ones, uh, the only effective ones. And they want, uh, they, they, they want to be able to have a, basically a monopoly on the, 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 the global arms market. They don't actually want to protect children. They want to be more capable of shooting them because their families can't shoot back. Correct. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it, it is it is a real theater in the fact that, you know, when people think that government wants to save children, um, you know, that right there is laughable, you know, uh, considering the fact that, you know, two thirds of Mordor on the Potomac, as I refer to D.C., um, <laughs> you know, it, is in some form or another involved in pedophile or pedophile rings. Um, easily, uh, the numbers are so high, uh, that's the only way you can explain why there's, there's never any investigations or the investigations always, uh, turn up a, a cold trail. Um, and that's pretty obvious. Um, you know, and it's global. I'm not going to say that it just happens in the U S I would say that it is, I think Bill hit it, uh, real well the other day when he, he mentioned that basically, uh, pedophiles and politicians are basically made up of the same mindset of finding the most innocence of victims. Yeah. Uh, you're, I, will you, I was going to say you're going to have to, I didn't want to be demanding. Will you, uh, send us a link or two kind of, uh, substantiating that, uh, claim about DC and pedophilia? Oh, the link? <laughs> about two thirds well, of it. You know, yeah, no, that, that, that is, that is one of, uh, those are one of my, you know, typical, this is a hand wave kind of a number. Um, what I would tell you is, is you're not going to find a link like that because people like Seth Rich end up, you know, if, if, if anybody remotely has any proof of those kinds of things, they end up dead. And so, you know, you're, you're not going to actually find proof, you know, outside of the onesies and twosies, you know, like, um, uh, the Masada agent, you know, the, uh, Wiener. Yeah. Who, who, ba who basically got caught with his, with his hands in the cookie jar and they basically decided to, uh, let him die on the vine. Yeah. I, I'm, I don't know what I, I, I need proof. That's, I'm, that's what I'm talking. I, yeah, I need yeah. like some more evidence to like, believe some of that obviously pedophilia sure. you know uh, pederasty happens in washington dc and certainly if there are giant pedophile rings of you know groups of people that are secretly raping children on the regular there is no group that i would expect more than the political class to be doing correct of course they are exactly the poli political class is exactly the type of people that get their jollies from power and from extreme power differentials over others and few are greater than the state and the individual and adults and children so i well, what i wouldn't I would be shocked but i yeah, I'm, I'm I, uncomfortable I would, making any would, claims. Sure, sure, sure. I understand. Look, look at the number of people who are conducting the investigations and then find out that most of them are actually citizens on Reddit that are conducting, you know, like oh, the, um, you know, the, 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 the pedo gate, the pizza gate, all those types of investigations, you know, do some, some of them are just, you know, I heard from this place or I heard from that place. And so all they're really doing is mimicking or echoing what they heard from somewhere else. But there are, um, you know, a good half dozen that I have actually seen video that I say, you know what, this guy's doing some analysis. This gal's doing some analysis and you can actually see the wheels turning. And, you know, you think to yourself, you know, I wonder how much longer they're going to be before they end up like Seth Rich, especially when they use their real names on uh, on YouTube. Um, you know, uh, the one the one guy that got booted from uh, mainstream media, I can't remember his name right now off the top of my head, but, you know, Ben Shapiro, he, he's like, no, 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 this is um, he, 
No. Okay. He, he has a ton of YouTube videos out there right now. He's on there forever. You know, they, they blocked him off of Twitter and they got rid of him and stuff. But, you know, when you, when you hear, you know, his tone, you heard his tone change from maybe something, there's something to this, to the more he's scratched at the surface. It's, it's like he's now, you know, 13, 13 floors down into the dungeon of conspiracy theories. But, you know, as most end caps are, you know, intimately aware, you know, the word theory is, is only attributed to the fact that most times the only proof ends up, you know, you know, buried, you know, buried in a hole out past Shangri-La, you know, so good luck finding that kind of, um, you know, that, that, that kind of proof. And so what I do is, is I kind of try to find the, the middle space, if you will, as far as bearings and say, okay, you know, some of this, uh, you know, pedo gate is, is real. It's pretty obvious. And then some of it, you, you, you think to yourself, you know, what person who actually takes an oath, you know, let's say, for instance, an FBI agent takes an oath and does not investigate some of these things when it's in their area of, of, of investigations. You know, not, not some FBI agent up in Seattle, you know, and it's not his job. I'm talking about people who are actually in that area. Their offices are either finding missing persons or finding, you know, um, exploited children, all those types of offices. I mean, God knows there's a, there's enough of them. There's, there's way too many, of course. But the point is, is that, you know, those people are there most times because they believe in what they do. And so if they believe in what they do and they come across stories like this, you know, my question is, why is it that they say, oh, that can't possibly be true? You know, where they're so dismissive and, and maybe that's just because they've never taken any red pill. And so they don't realize uh, what occurs in that dichotomy of all of a sudden the realization that, you know, that life is not quite what you thought it was at, you know, a few minutes prior. And so maybe they haven't come across that at that point. And so, you know, I, I keep thinking the more light that's exposed, you know, the, the more light that's brought to this, the more of these stories that come up, um, you know, it, Look at how long it took for the name Seth Rich to be mentioned in mainstream media. You know, not that I even watch mainstream media, but, you know, I see links to it. I click on it every now and then. And then it, two to three minutes into it, it usually confirms why I canceled cable back in 2008. It's unbelievable what they report yeah. on and the stuff that they focus on. It's so it's such a load sure. of bullshit. Like sure. The way that so, they present information is crazy, and what they choose to pre- present is so unimportant. Yeah. Uh, back, back to the, the actual question that you had, because I, I tend to rabbit trail a yeah. lot. Yeah, that's right. Um, but back to the original question, though, that you asked is, is that, you know, that, that potpourri... Thank you. Forgive the name, but, you know, that, that whole process of, you know, what is the best method to reach out and try to, you know, either a say, Hey, question what you're reading. You know, that's a seed. You plant that seed on somebody and, you know, down the road, they may say, you know what? I remember a guy saying to me, and that happened to me too. I remember several times people would say something to me. And then when I finally managed to choke down the first of many red pills, I remember thinking back and saying, holy shit, what else was I wrong about? And so at that point, it was like, open the floodgates. I'm going to start devouring every single possible red pill that I missed out there. And then I went back and I literally had to reevaluate everything that I believed to include my actual relationship with God. I I went back and I reassessed and reevaluated everything. And it took me about two or three years to go back and do that. I was in the middle of a degree program. Um, I was taking classes. I was arguing with professors left and right. You know, I, I had history professors, you know, practically crying. And, and it was, it was funny because 
to the effect that when I was finished my degree, they asked me to come back and teach history at their university. Wow. And That's so cool. to me, y- yes, because they were like, well, are you going to go into a master's program? And I'm like, well, I'm planning on it. And they're like, well, we want you to come back and you can teach here while you're in your, and then a couple of things happened and, you know, divorce and a couple other things happened. And, you know, so I didn't take that path, but to me, it was, it was a real eye opener to say, you know what, the cadre, the, the professors that taught these classes that sat through some of my very, very difficult questions that I asked them in the libertarian, you know, uh, mindset. Um, I was, I had a class with a judge and he first day of class with him, second question out of my mouth, he looked at me and he says, you're a libertarian, aren't you? And I said, well, in philosophy, yes. And so, you know, at that point it was, it, it was like, okay, I've got your number, you know, he's got me figured out. Yep. And the funny thing is I, I had him off balance the entire course because you know, he was taking maybe what he read at like reason.com or mm-hmm. taking what he read, you know, at Lou Rockwell and didn't really fully encompass, you know, the fact that quite frankly, no two libertarians believe the exact same thing. You know, everybody is, you know, truth is on, is on the auction block. Um, you know, uh, and so a lot of people, they're just, they're searching for truth. And quite frankly, most people are willing to sell, you know, whatever it is that they can sell instead of actually just saying what they really mean. And, yeah. and you saying know, it from I, a I found, principled place, which exactly, actually gives you a exactly. really strong foundation from which to have a discussion, even with people that are far more knowledgeable than you, because they almost always, especially if they're status, they always have inconsistent philosophies about how to function in the world. And that is exactly what it fell down to is, is that I realized that I had double think going on inside my head. And I, you know, I I have to say a lot of this came through Bill Buford. We really spent a lot of time together. We've been, you know, best friends since 2001. And I mean, he literally painstakingly, took me from a neoconservative, like rabid Zionist to a libertarian. And sometime around 2008, you know, I was big into the Ron Paul campaign. I had signs, everything. I was really involved in that. And then when I realized, because Bill kept telling me, he's like, you watch, he's like the Republicans, they're going to, they're going to sell him out. They're going to make him look like he's an idiot. They're going to, they're going to, you know, they're going to tarnish him. They're going to, you know, his name is going to be dirt. And, and sure enough, I mean, to watch the way the other uh, candidates responded to the statements that you or I would look at what Ron Paul said and say, thank you. I'm so glad that you said that. That's exactly the truth. And they would look at him like it was absurd. And that was when I realized that it's theater. It's theater. And, and and the only actors are not saying their lines. They don't know how to respond to that. that's right. The only person that wasn't acting on the stage was Ron Paul. Every single, every single one of them, you know, it was, it was, it was just ridiculous to look at, at the amount of lies coming out of their mouths. And, and to, to you know, for them to, you know, like I, Giuliani, you know, took his hits on, uh, on, on uh, Ron Paul about nine 11 and his comments about nine 11. And, you know, it was almost like, you know, it was almost like that's why they had Giuliani on that stage, because they they felt like a, a majority of Americans would believe that no one should have more veracity and authority on 9-11 than the very person who was the mayor at the time when it occurred. And so it was almost like they had already, you know, uh, hedged their bets. In the process, you know, when they were putting all those numbers together. But at that point, that's when I realized that that Mordor and the Potomac cannot be reformed. It cannot be reformed. It's not possible. And so that's when I started to take a look at decentralized efforts that are going on across the country and quite frankly, across the globe that have more to do with, you know, 
Uh, I don't know if you remember the bureau crash days. Um, back in the days of bureau crash, Adam Kokesh was involved. Adam and I were actually in, in contact all the time on uh, bureau crash back in the day. Um, there was a couple others. Um, and I'm, I feel bad that I'm not remembering everybody, but the, the guy that started Cop Block, I can't remember his name right now. But Adam anyway, Freeman? Yes, Adimo, thank you. And there, there was a couple others that were involved in other projects as well. And we were all involved in, during that process. And that was in the 2008, 2007, 2008 timeframe. A lot of people later said that that effort was designed to try to pull the Republicans into the, or the Libertarians into the Republican uh, voting bloc. That could have, that could have been possible. Um, but the thing is, is that there was a lot of good ideas being passed back and forth on bureaucrash. And it was really sad when they shut the site down. Um, but the point is, is that a lot of those people that I know, that I remember by name, by their picture, some of the YouTube videos they posted back in 2008 and 2007 that went on and they were successful, you know, cop block. Look at how successful cop block is, you know? Yeah. and. And so I, I look at all of those. That this is called distributed um, espionage or distributed subversion. That's what this is. This is there's no one central guy, and th this is why I tell people, you know, you can't say, well, oh, Stephen Molyneux, that's the only guy I listen to, and everything he says is exactly the, you know, correct, and everybody else is wrong, and you can't do the same thing with, you know, Cantwell. Or, you know, I mean, just go down the line of all these people, you know, and, and, you know, so, some of them I've met and, and they're great folks, you know, like, um, Adam Kokesh is great. I, I, um, I've met him. I, I think he's a, a good guy. Uh, some people, you know, tend to, um, have their own, uh, bones to pick with them and, and that's okay. Uh, that's not an experience that I, that I experienced, but the point is, is that there are a lot of, Folks, once you like rise to like this level of figurehead them where everybody's like, oh, listen to this person. Oh, you got to listen to that person, you know? And the, the point is we need a thousand, we need 10,000 of those people. We need a hundred thousand people. We, we need, yeah, we need, we need 20,000 people who in their real lives have other people referring them to this person. Yeah, well, and and exactly. you know, it's it's a little bit beyond that because when when the the classic question anarchists get asked, you know, who would do X? Who would build the roads? Well, you know, no one person builds the roads. No one person can build a pencil. That's what I pencil was about. And when you, you start to realize that it's not one person we need, but it's you know countless individuals willing to tirelessly defend liberty. That's that's when that's when you start to really open your eyes to the idea that centralized institutions are never the answer, much less with government, who has shown itself to be a hugely unethical and ineffective behemoth of bastards. That's right. Central planning fails, just like Hayek said. Yeah, of course, it relies on such incredible arrogance that it's just doomed to. Yeah. Um. Yeah, getting back, uh, what what have you getting back to kind of the original question? Yeah. What sure, what have you sure. found to be effective at red pilling people? Do you do like highly specific type memes to red pill or more? Just uh, I don't know if you have an answer to that. But, yeah, no, I do actually. Okay. I I have I have several, and let me tell you, um, just a personal success story. I'm not going to mention him by name, okay? Because he probably wouldn't appreciate it, but. Personal success story, a friend of mine that Bill Buford and I used to shoot with for years and years and years, big time cop, retired cop, everything was neocon, neocon, neocon. Do you know that to this day, yes, big time. And so to this day, he has actually turned completely around and now he's actually going out. He, he went up to... Um, you know, I, I live in Arizona. He went up to Phoenix and he went and, and listened to Larkin Rose in Phoenix, like drove there on purpose to go listen to Larkin Rose because that's where he's at in the process. You know, so for people to say, well, libertarian only takes six months to become an anarchist, you know, that, that's kind of a joke. I think it's more of an inside joke. 
Um, because some people, quite frankly, they are so deep in their chains. They, and lo- they, they love their chains. They lift them. And, and so they, they, they are so um, just completely in love with the state to the point where they have to experience it's sort of like someone who actually is in love with a person who's bad for them. And, and, and what is the yeah. process that you go through to try to open their eyes to the fact that that person is not good for them? Yeah. Because if you start talking bad about the person they love, they're going to dismiss you and never want to talk to you again. I've experienced that. I know what it's like. And so, you know, it, it takes patience. It takes the right, you know, type of conversation and so, I mean, the real answer is one person at a time. Like, there's no one meme that's going to win every gun owner over to, you know, not liking the state and hating the thin blue line. There's no one meme that will do that. You know, it will literally take someone out there who will talk to that one person who says, well, you know, I'm really confused about my, my thoughts because, you know, as much as I... As much as I love guns, I also love cops. And I haven't quite figured out who it is that's going to come to my door and take my guns. You know? Or I, I have figured you it got, out, and I'm got, very uncomfortable with that reality. Exactly. And, and, but that's the point. And, and so, you know, it, it, it literally has got to get down to that level of discussion, you know, to where these, these guys start to, like, say, oh, wait a second. So you're saying that if I have a Molin Lave bumper sticker and then a thin blue line bumper sticker that I actually have double think in my head? And the answer is yes, of course they do. And we all know that, but they don't see it. And so it, it requires that process. That's why I had that great big huge meme campaign this past week for um, it, it was basically gun sense, wear orange, and you know what I did? I started 12 hours earlier and I decided I would fill up all the hashtags that they would be using with pictures of genocide and democide. And <laughs> because I thought, you know what, if I get enough of those pictures and enough of those memes and I get enough people to tweet or retweet what I was tweeting, then the numbers would start to actually. And at some point, somebody's going to click on that wear orange hashtag and say, oh, let's see who else was doing this. And next thing you know, they start seeing pictures of a Bosnian mass grave that says, this is a Bosnian gun-free zone. You know, the idea was sometimes truth has to smack you in the face. And, and That's and, why I and, like you Cantwell know, a lot. Well, yes, I understand that. And uh, I'm not going to talk bad about Cantwell. But what I will say is that, you know, that is one of those cases where just an absolute smack in the face truth to where, you know, it, maybe I don't care about, about the person that reads that, um, that meme and says, Oh, this is terrible. Look at this. They're putting pictures of mass graves on it. Maybe I don't care about them. And, 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 and that's terrible to say, but you know, at the end of the day, you know what? They're not going to care about you when they see you drug from your home and your children in chains while the police go through all your personal belongings and say, yep, we found one of those extremists that believes in liberty. Not only do they not not care, but they're going to vote for that and tirelessly campaign online for it. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And And it's so so important to to paint the truth in accurate terms. When, When you are talking about something that is very evil, it is good to explain very clearly just how yeah. evil it is. And if you need to use an image to do that, then yeah. go for it. I mean, a huge, the, the evil of the state cannot be over expressed or overemphasized. It's a complete Look, we're, uh, monster. We're outgunned. We're outgunned. We're under resourced. You know, I mean, we're literally doing everything that we can out of our own hide, out of our own time, out of our own money. Most ANCAPs I know, and especially Agris are spending much of their time trying to figure out how to not pay the state at all. And so, you know, they're putting a serious investment into subverting the process. And in many ways, actually at their own, at their own cost, 
You know, there are agorists that go into business where they would make a lot more money if they if 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 they were actually you know within the you know out of the gray market and into I guess what we would call the white market. You know, yeah. if we had to use a word, and and so you know, a lot of agorists they wouldn't make the money that they make. Um, they would make more in the white market, but they realize that if they go into the white market and leave the gray market, they're sacrificing their principles, their belief system. And so for those agorists, you know, the ones who tirelessly figure out a way around the tax codes and not to, you know, to starve the beast, you know, if if one person's starving the beast, I'm not going to go out there and say, well, because I can't starve the beast, your idea is dumb. You know what I'm going to say? I'm going to say, good for you. You did the due diligence to figure out what you had to do to flip the middle finger at the state in your own way. And I applaud you. It doesn't mean I'm going to follow your same path, but good for you. And so that's what I mean by this distributed effort, you know, where share ideas, don't criticize other people's ideas. Um, You know, the exception, I guess, would be when you start to, you know, say, you know, like maybe violating the NAP, you know, the right. non-aggression principle or, right, things or like advocating that. for more you government know, or that we yeah. need more government you know, and, to shrink. Yeah. The we government. need more government. Yeah. We need, we just, we just need the right, we just need the right slave managers and in, in the, in Mordor on the Potomac. Yes. If you know, they if we will just, just had the right policy, slave manager. We'll free. Yeah. If, if we just had another Abraham Lincoln, Yeah, you know, yeah. and so, so it, it's yeah, you know, I mean, it's, not to <laughs> not to be too much in the shameless self promotion area, but you know, that's the reason I'm selling shirts at this point. It hasn't made me much money. Thank you for your purchases, by the way, Skip. Um, but oh, good. I hope that somebody sees these shirts, gets pissed off, and like confronts the person wearing them or looks up the ideas online, so that there can be some sort of conversation. I want to ignite that and. The yeah. way I see it, one of the easiest yeah. ways to do that is to provide things that people might want to wear in public that have the uh, the 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 extreme message on it, the extremist pol- anti political message. And that's exact. I wore your t shirt last night to a barbecue. What people think You're, of it? The, and, and, what and what one was it? It, up, it was the make Make America Defiant Again. Oh yeah, I like that one. And, and I and I opened the T-shirt, you know, because I, I of course I'm, I'm carrying, right? And but because I'm because I go to my neighbors and I imbibe, I, I I wear concealed because I know that when I walk from my neighbor's house to my house, you know, if somebody sees me open carrying carrying a fifth of uh, scotch with me that it's not going to look good for me. And so I go ahead and I can still carry for that process. You know, now everybody, all my neighbors know that I carry all the time. And when I'm over there, you know, I'm not stupid. I don't get drunk. I don't fall down or anything like that. I don't remove my firearm from my holster. Just a heads up to folks who do carry when they drink alcohol. Very stupid idea. The only time it should come out of your holster is when your front sight is on your, you know, you're putting your front sight on a target. And so the way I look at it is, you know, I'm going to go over to my neighbor. I'm going to have a drink or two. I'm going to have a good time. We're going to have some conversation, maybe play some cards against humanity or something like that. But at the end of the day, you know, my job when I'm over there is to at every single chance I get, I put a chink in the armor of the state. And, and, and for every opportunity, I, I have a chance to bring up the fact that, you know, things aren't really what you think they are, you know. And so, I mean, there were some interesting conversations yesterday just based off the T-shirt, you know, and, and most most of my neighbors are like, yeah, hell yeah, that's an awesome shirt. I love that, you know, and they're probably thinking, oh, yeah, he's, he must be a Trump supporter. But when I get into it. <laughs> And I tell them that, in my opinion, Trump is as much of a communist as as Hillary was, you know, then their eyes get really, really big, you know, because all of a sudden they realize they're not the extremists they thought they were. They've not met an extremist yet. Yeah, they're not defiant. They aren't That's pro right. freedom. The way no. everyone likes to think about themselves. I, I live in Wisconsin and near rural areas, or so there's a bunch of neocons around here. As well, right. so you get a lot of the, a lot of the people who claim to be, 
pro freedom, you know, thin blue line, don't yeah. tread on me, <laughs> that, that kind of nonsense. But, but you know, with people like that, what I found is the, the best way to find a way to their discussion or, you know, to get into the points that you want to make with them is to say, well, I like freedom too. I like freedom so much. I think that everybody should be able to carry a gun anywhere they want. And see, as soon as you say that, whoa, 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 okay, uh, you know, you need to slow your roll on that freedom right there. You know, I mean, you understand, you, you need to have a permit, you know, and of course, the, you know, the, the geeky voice starts to come into their voice, you know, I mean, you got to have a permit before you start wearing this stuff, because, you know, I mean, if you don't have the right permissions, I mean, you know, there, there, could, there could be, there could be anarchy. Yeah, I, the way you're talking, I think as a, a general sort of principle. If I'm talking to a Republican, I like to try to make them sound like a Democrat. And if I'm talking to yeah. a Democrat, I like to make them sound like a Republican. If you that can take exactly the conversation that I way. Do. Yeah. Yes, I agree. I agree. I, I do that exact same thing. And, you know, I, I, look, I come across a very, very wide demographic, you know, uh, both in my job and just in the fact that, you know, because a lot of my friends are either veterans or still on active duty even. And, you know, when you have conversations like that, you know, with active duty, you have to be careful because, you know, I mean, you can completely demoralize a person to the where, you know, you, you basically, you took, you took their Christmas away, you know? And so you have to be really careful with that because, you know, they, they're in the process of trying to make long term decisions about their life. Say, okay, look, I realize that this is kind of where you're at and maybe you don't agree that we should be in Iraq. Don't, you know, run out and do something brash like, you know, oh, fuck the army and I'm going to get out right now and I'm going to get a dishonorable discharge. Don't, don't go that route. But, you know, go through the process. Do the due diligence of thinking, okay, long term, what is it that I want to do? Where is it that I want to go? And, and, and then slowly work yourself, wean yourself off of the state. I mean, I, I'm still weaning myself off the state. I'm not going to lie. You know, I'm still in the process. You know, I'm still in the process of getting debt free, you know, and quite frankly, unless you're debt free, you really can't make decisions that don't have second and third order effects on you. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Depending you, you on can't the make decisions. Debt, but... That's right. Yeah. I mean, whether it's, it's a house, whether it's student loans, you know, whether it's car loans, whether it's credit cards, you know, I, I'm, I'm hell on credit cards. And, you know, my wife is like even harder on credit cards. I mean, in her mind, she has like the credit card companies in the center of the dartboard when we play darts in the backyard. Oh. You know, she's just like, oh, I fucking hate credit cards. That's painful. You know, so, yeah. All right, Skip, you've kind of rabbit holed us out of time. But thank, I'm sorry. No, I no, no, no. Don't though. apologize. Like I had a good time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wanted to let you go because I enjoyed listening to you. You're uh, intelligent and fairly articulate, so I appreciate it. Just, oh, uh, just hearing you real quick, engaging red holes. Yeah, we got a few minutes. Real quick, before we before we let you go, uh, I just wanted to make a callback and read a few things from the military's uh, proposed. Uh, meme warfare center which this is like an authentic document from vault 7 um, the proposed yeah. meme warfare center the MWC uh, is as a staff organization has the primary mission to advise the commander on meme generation transmission coupled with uh, detailed analysis on enemy friendly and non-combatant populations the meme warfare center aims for a full spectrum capability of meme generation analysis quality control ass and assurance and organic transmission apparatuses the proposed meme warfare structure lays in stark contrast to the ad hoc nature of current io and jpotf formations and it has like yeah. a chart of, of of essentially how these things are set up you know like how to transmit uh, different sorts of memes and, and by memes they don't just mean the images with with text they mean like ev every sort of meme in a more like mimetics Dawkinsian sense as well that's something I noticed looking through the documents because like you know I'm sort of like Alex Jones in that way I have the documents and as soon as Vault 7 was out I downloaded it um, but the military memes that they want are 
Um, military operations produce memes, both intended and unintended. The unintended effects of memes are normally regarded as second and third order effects. On occasion, second and third order effects are the product of deliberate planning. However, many times they cannot be accurately forecasted. Memes, as defined above, are cultural bits of information replicated and transmitted, transmitted from mind to mind. Memes influence, affect, generate, and alter ideas. A central theme behind this replication and transmission is individual and societal contact and interaction. Contact in this sense connotes both direct and indirect means. Contact with the enemy, friendlies, or the community at large provides a vehicle or medium for, and then you know the next page I don't have up right now, but the, the, the essential idea is that um, if we want to fight the, the, the state on these terms, we need to start thinking in these terms, which is you know, yes. uh, th thinking in terms of who we can influence, but also who they can, how to make the message as ironclad as possible so that when it goes from mind to mind, it won't change and become what the enemy can use against us. Correct. Yeah, Correct. I think providing and helping people integrate these principles consistently in their life, so at least that foundation is ironclad, even as, you know, there's some other issues that, well, what about, you know, abortion and stuff, and there's all these, or there's areas, you know, where ANCAPs can disagree and have a different I ideas about what's true and right and what's in, in line with the NAP. But once you have those principles as a foundation, and that is ironclad, it really helps process the rest of the message in ways that are clear. Well, and you know, what I would say is, is that the one reason why um, our movement will not conduct um, psychological warfare is because it's based on deceit. Psychological warfare is based on deceit. Yes, yeah. it's, de yeah. it's based on deceiving people and getting them to believe something other than what is true. And so what I would say is, is that that's why we won't actually take the military operation of psychological warfare and flip it upside down and use it. You know, I, I use Ben Stone's uh, subversion manual. I think his, his manual is great. I, I agree. All right. We got to get out of here. Skip, will you tell people uh, <laughs> uh, where they can find you? If you want to be found on the uh, internets. Oh, on the internet. Yes, of course. Um, yeah. yeah not your to... address. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I'm like uh, wait a second. Uh, do I need to fly like the wrong kind of flag? Or what? <laughs> yeah, no, I am. I am on uh, Twitter, and uh, that's probably the best way to find me is on Twitter because I'm there pretty good, uh, pretty often. Yeah. And uh, my uh, my handle is at the free rifleman. So that's T H E F R E E R I F L E M A N. At the free rifleman is is my handle on Twitter. And if you didn't know how to spell that before, Skip did it for you. Shame on you. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> uh, Harding, you want to plug any of your shit? Uh, well, I I do want to say I'm selling shirts now. You can just Google Jeremiah and Money Hole, and you'll find my shit. Uh, you can also find Moment of Rage by the same method, or go to journalisticrevolution.com or IPM Nation. Dot com it is free pretty much everywhere you can usually find me just like by putting my name where the username thing goes um and what else there's something oh i was on a, uh, a stream yesterday discussing anarchy and its viability and statism in general with uh, the fox from the west so if you want to check out their channel you can do that as well and uh, i'll be one of the most recent videos so uh and it, you know aside from that uh listen to moment of rage fuck this state and uh, don't forget to educate people as much as you can. All right, thanks. And we'll link to most of this stuff that I remember on the episode page, episode 26 at time2free.us. You want to follow me on Twitter, it's at JeremiahJM, or you can follow the show's Twitter feed, which is me and Harding, at Chain Reaction, and the T is a one. Thanks a lot for joining us today. hope you guys enjoyed the show. Just a reminder... No show next week. All right. I hope you all enjoy yourself for the next two weeks, and we we'll look forward to talking at you soon. Thanks a lot. Peace.